Oh, shalom, Rastafari. Greetings. And they Rasia Dino Stefari Neng. And this is Friday the thirteenth, according to the Gentiles, um, April thirteenth. And as you might already be aware of in this um season, this is the end of the seven days of the unleavened bread, unleavened bread, um, Passover, then it's the seven days of unleavened bread. And this here marks the seventh particular um, day. Now, hopefully, ones are, you know, especially the disciples and other brothers and sisters who are, who are curious about what it is that I and I hold and bear witness to is true concerning the revelation of Rastafari and the and the true Christ, our Black Lord and Savior Yeshua HaMoshiach. We will encourage to study. One can study with us and also do their own independent study. Study is is one of the crucial things to really get to know it for oneself. You know, um, and in this Passover season, this particular 2012 Passover season, first of all, I think this is maybe the second Friday the 13th. I think Friday the 13th has been coming around kind of often. But be that as it may, not getting into any kind of um, false god superstition about Friday the 13th, we know that 13 is a god number. And what's interesting is that um, this uh, Pesach, or this Fasica, it actually began on the eve of the Shabbat, and now it fulfills um, also in this present time. Now, if we look at the scriptures, let's get our scriptures right here. If we look at the, the scriptures, I'm going to go to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23, because this is one of our, one of the seven high holy um, days or the seasons. There's three pilgrim um, festivals, but in the entire year, there's about um, seven, seven um, high holy days feasts, what we call the Moedim, or the Feast of Jah, or the Festivals of Jah. So when we speak about holy days and holy time, there are seven particular feasts, but there are three particular times. So when we study, you know, when we start to study our calendar, there's a lot that we can learn in studying um, our calendar, God's calendar, and the true calculation of time. Because time, according to the Western Gentile perspective, whether it's Greenwich time or so forth and so on, is so far off of true time. And... To get into it is a study in itself, but basically our holy days, as many of you all are familiar with, um, for example, Shabbat or the Sendet, it begins from the, the evening and morning, according to the Almighty. So although they call this Friday evening right now, Friday the 13th, uh, 2012, actually it is not Friday evening, but it's the Sabbath or the Shabbat evening. So it's actually the evening of the seventh um, day that we're experiencing now, and then when the sun rises on so-called Saturday, that would be the day. So it's evening and the morning and the dawning of light or the so-called day, actually that makes one day. So it's a, it's, it's a key it's a key it's, it's a key matter that has been lost in the West. So you know, a lot of questions we have about time, such as the, the three days and the three nights of Christ, um, um, Jonah or Jonah's parable, you know, can also be properly construed even from the scripture, overstanding that particular nuance there. But anyway, be that as it may, um, the main meditation is, is, is the meditation of, of Christ and the cannabis. This is really what we are desirous to, to to reason on as well as to share some of our own subjective or personal experience because really what is your experience of this memorial time? That's the key thing. 
And maybe for some it's just a learning process, ones are learning more about it or learning about it from a, a so-called black or Ethiopian Hebrew and elect Rastafari, Rastafari perspective. But once one has those basics and, and, and has come to, has, has basic, as we would say, faith or, or amen or imnet, because faith is so necessary, it's the first, it's the first key thing. It's like what we'll call trust or, or confidence or, or bearing witness to something as being real. Like what do we bear witness to? What do each of us? And this is, this is what it means to, to eat of, of, of the body of, of Christ and, uh, and, and to drink of his blood. Not literal. We're not speaking about no fire bun, a cannibal. You see, these, these are... These are, are symbols and types. So let's understand the metaphysical of the scripture. You know, the metaphysical of the scripture. And this is what's so key about both um, the Son, the Bain Ha Elohim, Yeshua Ha Moshiach, according to the canonical gospels. And even when we start to study the so called Gnostic gospels as well. But starting with the the canonical Gospels, or what we have as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the Epistles and, and Revelation. It's very really key to understand the, the, the use of word. You understand the use of word. We call it a Hebrew idiom. There's a particular idiom, so we speak about Christ's sacrifice. Now, before we can even go into Christ as, as cannabis or the cannabis Christ and, and the real meaning of the lamb's bread, we have to build on a basic foundation. You understand? And we have to build on the, the foundation that's already laid. And if we don't overstand that foundation, in other words, the bread and wine, what was the bread and wine symbolic of in the time of the Moshiach? And what what memorial was he fulfilling or perfecting that was based on the exodus, what is spoken of as the exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt? You understand? Know what, what, what is all that about? Is it an actual, is it historical? There's an argument and debate about whether this is all historical or some say it's, it's all mythological. But here's the question. When is it practical for I and I? In other words, if this is truly um, the way of God, the way of Jah, if Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and he says he has come to give us life, that we might have life and life more abundantly. Therefore, in our experience, in our walking in Christ, and experience of Christ, are we truly experiencing Christ spiritually, or is it just a so-called religiosity? You know, is it a religiosity? Now, reading and study and discipleship and taking notes and investigating things, it's just getting the basic data. It's just basic data that we're addressing and that we're speaking about. When the real knowledge of the Gnosis, it, it comes from the individual, um, processing that, in other words, gaining intelligence out of it, and what is your testimony, what is your experience? You're saying, what are you, are you experiencing anything? Are you growing? Or is it just, is, is just a mundane, an outer thing, you know? So that was one of the things that Christ spoke about, that when he spoke about earthly things, he used earthly examples to explain even higher types, like, for example, with leaven. It's the seven days of unleavened bread. And we look here in Leviticus chapter 23, which is a summary of the feast of, of Yahweh, um, the Sabbath and the feast. Now you have to remember and take note of, or disciples take note of this, that you have two types of Sabbaths. You have the weekly Sabbaths, like this is a weekly Sabbath, the, the Friday evening or the eve of the Shabbat, the Sunday. And then you also have the, the annual Sabbaths. You understand the annual Sabbaths. 
And now the, the I want here's what I want you to get in this 2012 this particular time, and this is another divine sign that in 2012 this particular year for the Passover, the Pesach, the Fasica, the crossing over, it coincides both with two like a double Sabbath, you know, like a double Sabbath, the double horizons in a sense have been hit from the beginning on the sixth to its fulfillment now on the 13th, you understand? Know and then we can look at the, 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 the significance of 13, you see, because some say 13 is a God number, you know, like Christ and his, and his 12 um, disciples. He would be the so-called 13th. And we have the 12 tribes of Israel, and we can point to many other examples we even have the, the 12 signs of the zodiac. And this year, there's, there's another particular sign that's, that some say should be the 13th sign called Ophiuchus. You know what I'm saying? Ophiuchus, or the, some say the serpent bearer, and this is right around that particular time coming up, December 12, 2012, which we say is, 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 is one of the heavenly signs you understand? Not saying that that is the day of the Lord, and we've touched on this in in some other um, postings. Because we just want to remind ones, you know, be diligent. And of course, it may sound like it, but really find the truth for yourself. And when you study this idea of the day of the Lord, it is not. First of all, it says that no man know the day or the hour. You understand? Because we think that this has to do more with the consciousness and those of the remnant. In other words, when the number of the remnant is fulfilled, when this when gale or this good news is and the revelation of Rastafari has been properly revealed according to what pleases Abu Kadus, Kadus Abatachin, and in the name of Yeshua HaMoshiach. And ones have had the opportunity to decide in favor of or against. You see, there is a correspondence with the consciousness or the lack of consciousness of humanity, not so much a particular heavenly sign that says that it's, it's going to happen today, but these are signs that have to be understood in connection with his word and the logos. And we're not saying that the Mayans and other cultures, they were, of course, like we said before, the Almighty is not, um, he's not unjust to not reveal it to these other people because they happen not to be Beta Israel, or they happen not to be Hebrews, or they happen not to be Ethiopians or blacks or so forth, or ancient Egyptians. Of course, he, the Almighty will reveal it to all nations. So it's for us to um, begin with our foundation and to compare what we hear out there with what is written and to headrest and to meditate and to pray on these things for understanding or overstanding and not to be so um, emotionally, like the emotional response is not really the response that, that, that we should have because that means we still are immature you understand? And what we must do in this process of discipleship is to grow up and to, to, to be guided by that word, where it says the law or Torah, Torah, which is the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, the basic foundation, is our schoolmaster. You understand? Until Christos or Moshiach, the Messiah conscious or the Christ experience comes until we have that, that, that that real experience in Christ. I often compare this with the, because I know that people nowadays who would hear this would understand it in context with it, with the Matrix movie. It's like Neo is like that, 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 that newcomer or that, that new disciple, that, that, that novice, so to speak. And as he grows in consciousness, Right, he begins to actually see the living, you know, the living matrix around him. This is what it means when Christ says that he will sup with one. So the word 
is this not just the word or historical data, so forth and so on, but it becomes actionable. You know what I'm saying? Where the word is no longer the, the dead letter, but it becomes the living spirit. You see, so this is one of the goals for those who come to God, the true God, Jah, in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus Christos. Irrespective to the Jew, the Hebrew, to the Ethiopian Hebrew, the black Jew, to Ainai, it came first. But then also to the Gentiles, or the so-called barbarians, or the other peoples. You understand? Because remember, if we say that all peoples came from the Black Sea, that mean, and we say the black man is the original, that means that Adam, you understand, or Atum, you understand, was that one who fell. That means that we as black people, we have fallen from something, and there must be a reason that has to do with our own self-responsibility, but we are in a state of unconsciousness. And this is one of the reasons why some of these teachings and the gospel, in a sense, remains hidden to some, because the God of this world has blinded their minds. You see, that their minds are, are blinded to this, but you, my brothers and sisters, and those who are interested um, in the teachings of His Majesty, um, we give thanks, and this is a, a point that we wanted to make concerning um, not just to say it's a holy day or a holiday, but to remember that these are memorial times. Christ says, Yeshua says, to do this in remembrance of me. So as we spoke about with the very keeping of the Shabbat, the command or the key word is the article says, says to um, remember the Shabbat day, to, to think about the Sabbath day, how to keep it holy, yet to edesah, how to keep it special, important, rever reverential. But really, it's a spiritual time to really, to, to really reboot, you know, because the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. You see, so some people say that to not keep that, but there's no rest to the wicked. So, you know, that's why they, they rest not, because there's no rest to the wicked. We're not saying they personally might be, quote, wicked, but they are living their lives being guided or enslaved by wicked world-ruling so-called principles that are not of the God and Father of our Black Lord and Savior, Shua HaMoshiach, but are of the opposer, that are, above, uh, of, of that, that are from the adversary. You understand? But be that, as, be that as it may, right here, we have now the Passover, right? The Passover. And this is really where our, our yearly feast and festivals from Fasica of Yahweh begin. And as given to Israel, these were simply seven great, it says, religious festivals. I would say spiritual feastings, which were to be observed every year, which were to be observed every year in a particular um, cipher or we can say cycle, a particular orbit. The first three verses of Leviticus uh, 23 do not relate to the feast, but separate the Sabbath it separates the Sabbath from the festivals. So we have the weekly Sabbaths, and then we have the annual Sabbaths. For example, when we look at um, the Feast of Yahweh, the Unleavened Bread, which is a memorial, Metasebia, a Metasebia Baal. It's a memorial feast. It says, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, let's actually just scroll. Let's start from the beginning of this chapter right here. Chapter 23 of Leviticus. Even though we're in another portion of Leviticus in this particular time, I think we're going to touch on um, uh, Shemeni. Shemeni, which is interesting because Shemeni means eighth. It means the number eight like cement, Bamarinya. So we have Shemeni in the Hebrew and we have cementenya, the cementenya or cementenya ken, like to say the eighth day. So we just had the fasica, the Pesach, 
for this 2012, the, uh, beginning on the 6th of, of April, right? Then we have the seven days. Notice the seven days. Then returning to the Torah portions that we are to continue study, reading, and growing in and be guided by, as says, this is our wisdom. It says, Shemini. So we have the eighth. So we have the Passover, seven days, and then the eighth. I mean, there is something just very beautiful about that seeing that it's not like the solar, you know, it's not like the solar days per se, but it's the lunar. You know what I'm saying? It's the reflected light is the Hebrew, the Hebrew Old Testament um, comparable to the lunar or comparable to the mother in a sense. New Testament is the fatherhood, it's the restoration of the family. You know what I'm saying? This is why Christ as our big brother, you understand? Our big black brother, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, is so important in restoring us as the once lost but now found data is Arayel, as well as those who in one way or another are derived from or have come from that original black or Ethiopic seed. You know, everybody says that, you know, life came from Africa, so forth and so on. Uh, yeah, all that might be correct, but we have to establish Jah's order. So the first thing we need to do is to learn Jah's order. This is why, you know, the teachings of His Majesty are very, very important, and we are praying that other brothers and sisters, other laborers, would also be spiritually guided and also be able to go out into the world, as Josh says, and make disciples as well. So to be discipled and become as the master, and then to go forward and disciple. This is what really assures us of a smooth transition for I and I from this old world into the true new world, or into Jah's world, or the world of Jah, if you please. Now, here it says that the first, okay, three verses, it says, okay, the Passover, verses 4 and 5. Now, it says that this, this feast is memorial, is a metasebia. This feast is, is something we must remember. You know what I'm saying? We must give it thought. It's not about how many gifts you buy for somebody, how much money, so-called, you spend, but it's a memorial. You understand? It, it, it is truly spiritual. You know, everybody talk about religion, religion, religion. But part of the reason why it gets into um, so-called religion and religion becomes a bad thing is because they lose focus on the logic or the logos of the word. Because if we read this, it says that these are the feasts of Yahweh, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month, at even is Yahweh's Passover. So that's not, now that's in the Belui Kidon. That's in the Old Covenant. That's what Christ now, Yeshua, has fulfilled, what Jesus Christos has fulfilled. Because now this feast is memorial and brings into view, it brings now into view redemption, upon which all the barakat, all the blessing, barakatin hulu, all the blessing it rests, or in a sense, you can even say it hangs or it is suspended, in a sense crucified, if you will, upon this. Typically, typ uh, typically it stands for, quote, Christos Fasikachin, Lenya Tardoalina, that Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. So now Christ in the fulfillment, which is New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. So you over, when, when we're talking about, we're studying Torah, we're studying the Old Testament, but not with the veil over our eyes. You understand? We're studying it in and through Yeshua, the testimony of Jesus Christos. We recognize that he is indeed the Moshiach. He is indeed the Messiah. He is indeed the Bain Ha'elohim, unfortunately some of our um, other namesakes as um, Jews, they, they do not recognize that to their own wound and to their own hurt, as well as the issues concerning, you know, the, the, the racial identity. But facts are facts, so we're going to move forward, those of us who recognize and accept the fact 
of Christ or Yeshua, Jesus being black. But now, that's, that's the earthly thing. That's the visible, that's the obvious thing. Now, to get into the spiritual, you know what I'm saying, to get into the liberty, you know what I'm saying, to, to prove that we are not just um, ethnic Hebrews, you know what I'm saying, or black Hebrews, black Jews, but we are spiritual Israel. You know what I'm saying? Prove that we are spiritual Israel by not just our word. The word is important. The witness is important. But by our examples. You know what I'm saying? By our example. And so we now have the, the template of Yeshua, of Jesus Christos, as an example for us. And one can refer to the teaching of his majesty, Kedemawi Haile Selassie, our God Father. In the King of Kings, he also points to the Lord of Lords, you understand, to Yeshua HaMoshiach as that example, you understand, as that, as that, um, ex who lived an exemplary life, you understand, which is a pattern for, for all humanity, irrespective of race or nationality or tribe or those particular um, matters. Now, typically, so it stands for Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us, 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. Now, after, after the 14th day, which was in this season, 2012, this was Friday the 6th, the past Friday. And this is why we posted the vids touching on certain elements of that, and hopefully that was helpful and instructive. Now, and... Um, then we have now the seven days, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verses 6 to verse 8. So now here, on the 14th day is the Fasica, right? Then it says, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Yahweh. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. In other words, that's another way of saying like a, 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 a Shabbat. And the first day is a Shabbat, right? Is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. In other words, you're not going to do whatever you do normally in the six days, five, six days of the week that, that make your papers, make your money, your occupational labor or whatnot. You, you, you're not going to do that. It's not talking about some basic things that people do for themselves, but it says whatever work you do, you know what I'm saying, to make money, and, I mean to speak to people nowadays. See, if we were, when we return to the land, well, it was a little bit different in the sense that you won't be maybe working for the Gentiles, but you will have your land and business, so forth and so on. And six days you shall do all your servile, your occupational, your business work. And the seventh day is the Shabbat. Now, in the same, in the same way, the first day of the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread, now remember, bread was speaking about not just the literal bread, you see, if you just think about just the literal bread and all the seven days are just about eating matzah and just drinking, you know, drinking wine, then you kind of missed it. You, I mean, you can do that, but the main thing is, is what do you have in your mind? You understand? Is your mind full? Has a fullness? Or is there mind emptiness? Beware of the mind emptiness. Make your, your eating or your indulgence. And this is very significant when we're speaking about now the cannabosa or the cannabis, and the cannabis Christ, and, and the lamb's bread as actually being, um, what we can say, the, the revelation, as Christ says, he won't eat of, he won't drink of this, of the fruit of this vine until he drinks of it anew in the kingdom. Matthew 26, I think, verse 29. It's very key right there. Well, he says he's not going to drink of this until you drink of it anew. Then we have furthermore by another um, gospel writer testifying that he blew upon them and he said to receive, right, to receive the what? The Holy Spirit. Now, according to the biblical story, what was forbidden in the beginning? It was a tree. They ate of this tree. They consumed of the tree. 
and then there was a, a fall, and then death came into the equation because of that disobedience and, and the ignorance and everything else that involved from it. Now, in Christ, we're told in the, in the New Testament, the Adish Kidan, through the Moshiach, we're told that now we have access once again to the tree of life. Now, the, the, the Kana Bosom or the cannabis, you understand? Know as a sacrament, it fulfills that to the letter. And this is what we, you know, we really want to get into uh, uh, a conversation about because in learning this, we learn even to refine or modify our own um, consumption, our own eating, and also the whole connection because there's a whole spirituality to this. You, you know, and even some of the questions why cannabis has a positive effect on one particular person, while cannabis may have a negative psychological um, adverse effect on someone else, is all explainable according to the Wengel, according to the gospel, and some basic principles that really don't require one to be um, uh, religious, in other words. Just be truthful, honest, and let's deal with the facts. You see what I'm saying? Let's deal with the facts. And I can say, well, Buddhists believe such and such and such, and that's the truth. It, it doesn't have anything to do with me, what, what my faith is. You understand? Is it a fact that these people, this is what they say? So be it. Don't have to make it worse. Don't have to distort it. Just factually deal with the truth. Because truth is very important in this process, in this life and the life to come. Verse 8, it says, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire. This is what's interesting. This is what's interesting when it says, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh, or to the Lord, if you please, seven days. Seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. So the seventh day, and this is, this is where we're at right now, 2012. So just see how interestingly enough even the holy days, the Hebrew holy days align in this present so-called prophetic um, 2012 period of time. Not to even mention, you know, some of the earthquakes and some of the hail storms and, 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 and the other signs in the weather, so forth and so on. But um, this, is, this, this is the rock to build on. This is the true foundation right here. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verses 6 to 8. Now, this feast, which actually concludes, we can say now, is concluding now, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, um, it speaks of communion. That's another key word, common union, where Christ says, and I will sup, I will sup with that one. This speaks of communion with Christos. This speaks of communion with Ha Moshiach or with the Mashiach, communion with Messiah. The unleavened wave loaf in the full blessing of his redemption, in the full barakat, in the full blessing of his um, uh, redemption, Bezanet, you understand? And of a holy walk. Now, the word holy walk, from a Hebraic sense, a Hebraic point of view, will be called the halakha. You, you might have come across that word um, if you've been studying with I and I, and if you've also studied other things, he, Hebraic and, and Judaic and Jewish, you come across halakha. Halakha, they will tell you that it deals with certain kind of laws, but it actually deals with a certain walk. In other words, in the New Testament, it speaks about and one's whose conversation, one's conversation in Christ, or one's behavior is how you com is like your comportment, how you how you your liberty, how, how you live, you understand, and how you walk according to um, Jah word, Jah truth, and 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 Jah truth and rights. In other words, in the real, not just what you know, but how you walk out these principles, how you live these principles, but literally the word halakha actually means walk. And the Ethiopic correspondence of halakha is akahed, the word akahed, which is a very interesting word too because 
also within that word is the, the sense and the idea of progress. You understand? Progress from, a, from another word than rimja, but akahed. But, but the root is haid, haidah, mahaid, which means to go. One's going, as it says, one's, one's sitting, one's going out, one's coming in, as we find that in the Psalms. This is, this is what's all connected. So we start to see how these various words and ideas in the scriptures, they connect and they form Jah's system. They form Jah's order. You know, and his true order, which can be verified by, by science, you know, by observation, you know, because it's real, it's true. And now we find the connection in the words. So it's like in the Matrix movie, once again, to use the Matrix movie as an example. You notice how, um, and, and me stay, I and I, sister, why she mentioned this to I and I. Though, we, though I've observed it, but there was the way it was articulated. You know, when you're looking at the Matrix movie and you see the, the, all, all the other people who are part of Zion, they're looking at the computer screens. Like you might be looking at the computer screens right now, right? And they're looking at the code on the screens and they're reading the code. But now Neo came to a particular Christ consciousness where he can actually just look while being in the Matrix and seeing beyond the so-called um, illusion and actually see the living code, you know what I'm saying, by looking at it. Now, I think as, as the movie progressed, others began to walk more out on, on faith because of Neo's demonstration. You know, I would say iron, sharp, and iron, each one teach one in that sense. So it's almost similar in the sense that what, what we're doing is studying the scripture. And as we've been faithfully studying, like, the Torah portions for the past um, two, three, or more years, well, but I'll say two, three years in this order, that means every Shabbat and, and the week following that particular Shabbat, studying, going over certain things. So just to know, well, what does this story, what does this tell? Just the basic at first. And then trying to now deal with some of the layers. You understand? Not particularly looking for anything hidden or secret, but as you start to learn what it is, and then you see how it's been you know, some of the obvious things that are right there, like the cannabis and Christ connection, you know, hopefully as ones begin to just, even if they're not consumers, you don't have to be a consumer of, of the cannabosum or the cannabis to recognize the truth. You understand? So those who love truth, they might, they might say, well, still, I agree with you. I'm not going to go out there and start burning herb because they, they're not at that particular level or that is not for them, yet it does not, um, eradicate the fact that cannabis, what we know as the cannabosum, is what Christ was pointing to as that fruit of the vine or that fruit of the earth being renewed. You understand? Remember the first miracle of Yeshua was at a place called Cana of Galilee. What did he do there? He turned what? Water into wine. Remember what says the power of John is to make stones his disciples turn real rockheads like I and I into disciples of his. You understand? So let's just recognize that reality first and foremost. So here we have the feast. It speaks of communion with Christ, the unleavened loaf, in, in the full blessing of his redemption and of a holy walk. So it speaks of communion with Christ, one, the unleavened wave loaf, in the full blessing of his redemption and of a holy walk. So we see three main main points that, that speaks in this communion. It is communion with Christ, the unleavened wave loaf, or to say that bread, in the full blessing of his redemption. So you have to remember that in the Louis Kidon in Old Testament, it was the Passover was the redemption of Jah's son, Israel, as a, as a corporate body, as a, as a corporate body, as a corporation. So when we're speaking about the God of the Hebrews, the, the Beta Israel, we're speaking about the mixed multitudes, because there were others who came along. We know Moses had an Ethiopian wife. We know that there were others from different tribes, you know what I mean, that were not per se, excuse me, Israelite, 
you know, or maybe per se Hebrew in that sense. They were not descendants of Abraham, but there was a gathering. Much is the same with Rastafari. Although, from our perspective, as the once lost but now found Beit Israel, as black sheep, you understand, know, as 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 Hebrews and and Ju Judahites or Afro Americans, and as black folks over here and Ethiopian Hebrews, well, of course, how we see it initially might be a little different than the faithful Gentile over here, over there. And yes, there are qualifications for faithful Gentiles, not to us, but according to the order, because Jah is not the author of chaos. So, so he gives generous and, and faithful regulations, you know what I'm saying, both to those who are of his ethnic group, as well as others who, if you check the dots, check the genealogy, come out of the Black Sea. You know what I'm saying? At some point in, 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 in history or in, in, in antiquity. Remember what the word says in, in the fullness of it, all in all. You understand? All in all. So as death came in through one man, Adam, you understand? That fallen black man. So then now life came in through one man our black Lord and Savior, Shua HaMoshia, thereby restoring this systemic anomaly. But the first aspect of it is, is when we say faith, because faith should lead to gnosis. Faith should lead to knowledge, in other words. You know, um, the, 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 the pistis, as they say in, in, in the, the Greek, should lead to um, both the wisdom and that overstanding, which is the gnosis, which is, which, is, which is to know the truth. That means that one, that therefore, is experiencing, you understand, is experiencing um, that particular reality. You know, it's almost like it's like reading about something, and then you actually get the experience or the opportunity, rather, to experience what you read about. You know, I mean, if you ever, if you ever experience that, I mean, it, it's it's one of the most amazing things. But then, when you actually are are living the experience, if someone else gave you their testimony, you can kind of say, okay, yeah, I agree with you over here, but I really don't agree with that over there because that wasn't really how I felt, or that wasn't like that for me. Well, in a sense, it's the same process as you're growing in the word. You understand? And that's when we come together. That's what we should testify, you know, concerning even right now, many of you all who tune into these, um, these kind of podcasts, so to speak, um, we look forward to, to hearing some of the item podcasts as well. You know what I mean? And it, it helps us with the conversation, you know, with the reasoning. This, you know, I mean, the secret things, you know, people say, well, we don't want Babylon. To, Babylon, some things are right in Babylon's face, and they don't know it. So stop thinking about that, because Babylon is not all in all, unless you are blinded by the God of this world. Now, the divine order here is beautiful. First, there is redemption. Then a holy walk. You know, in a lot of counterfeit forms of Christianity and religiosity, you know, where ones condemn you and, and, and they almost like want you to um, do the right thing, even though you was, you was born and accustomed, you, you're, as his majesty says, his imperial majesty says, your education, um, you know, awareness and environment has ill-prepared you. You know what I mean? Has ill-prepared one. No, the, part of the redemption you understand? Part of the redemption, if you buy back something, is it, is to restore. It's like Psalm twenty uh, twenty three, where it says, um, um, "And the Lord restored, and He restoreth my soul, for His, you know, for for His name's sake, He restoreth, He restores, He sends back to me." This is when Christ says, "If anyone who comes to me, they have to um, deny themselves." You know, and that means deny this 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 world view that has been programmed by a lot of illogical things. You know, a, a, a lot of our experiences are not logical. They're not they're not of Christ. They're not of real truth. Yes, they they exist. It's a reality, but it's not in and according to logic to God's 
truth in God's word. And this is why there is so much, um, to paraphrase, so much trouble in the world today. But um, as the King of Kings bore witness to, you know, like once man's attempts to do his own way, like the book of Eli even testifies to, you know, the Bible, you know, and the truth of the Bible, you know, will be waiting there. You know, it's Jah will be waiting there, and I and I hope to be there with Jah, you know, saying, waiting, you know, if they are, if they are for, for any others to come forward as it were. You understand? Because to pray that we would be found worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Stand where? I think that that prayer is speaking about Mount Zion. You, but Mount Zion is not to be standing up there just hanging out. But, but stand, we stand on a particular foundation, you know, a particular truth. You know what I'm saying? And it's not the literal, just literal standing on the mount, literally. But this is, this is a, a, a metaphor. It is a parable. You know what I'm saying? It is a parable. It is a, um, a kind of a proverb, a verbal hieroglyphic, in a sense, which explains that so we have to meditate upon these things and, and even reason and fellowship with one another. Well, what, what, what did you get out of that? Oh, well, what I got out of that is such and such. Well, why do you say that? Well, because when I look here in the scripture, it says this. Now, someone who comes in that sort of a reasoning, that means you're refining your search. It's like on the Internet. You can search for some things and then they'll ask you, do you want to refine your search? It's time now to refine our search. Many people say, yes, I've read the Bible from cover to cover, but what did you really get from it? You understand? It's better, like as Matthew says, to to like plow a small piece of land, you know, and turn it fruitful than to claim to be a, a an owner of vast idle land. And we can look at that outwardly as the, the, the physical type, or we can interpret that even spiritually. You remember what Christ said in Matthew chapter 13? When we spoke about the parables and the accent, why do you always speak in parables? Why do you always speak in example? Well, you know, it's like a, it's like a man walking. You know, why do you always do that? With that, and, and Christ said, it's for them who are without, who haven't taken that that proactive step to be taught of Christ and to learn of the Moshiach, as I and I have taken, and many of you all have taken that active step to begin to learn. Okay, what is this about? You understand? Let me do some research for myself. Let me download that. Let me check that out, you know, and to really learn about it for yourself. Because you're not going to know by so-called window shopping in that sense. You know what I mean? In other words, you have to test it. You have to prove it. But before all of that, you have to learn what's what. You understand? You have to learn what is what, what it is. You understand what it is. That's what you've got to learn first. So the divine order here. Is, is beautiful. First, it's redemption, and then it's a holy walk, and it gives us First uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, Second Corinthians chapter um, 7, verse 1, Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Now, from this particular day now, seeing that we're at this particular point at the end of the 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 feast for the unleavened bread. The next one coming up actually is um, what's known as uh, uh, first fruits. You understand, know which speaks of Christ risen. Now, first fruits. Now, the footnote here in the Schofield first fruits is Leviticus chapter twenty three verses ten to fourteen. Now, this feast is typical of resurrection, first of Christ, then of them that are Christ, in other words, those who belong to Moshia, those, belong, those who belong to our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, at his coming or at his um, revelation. First Corinthians um, 15, verse 23, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Now, here's what it says. Yahweh spake to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When ye be come into the land which I give to you. Now, that's a qualifier right there. You know, and some say, well, 
it isn't about Ethiopia repatriation so forth and Shashimani and, and going for well yeah. But since we have the time and the opportunity, let us do a little bit better than the the first um settlers because they didn't have much of the advantage that we have, even technologically speaking. I mean even even data wise. We have much more access to certain information. You know, just as regular people can find these things out there than the previous generations. Yes, Jah will judge, let Jah judge, but what we have to do now is be those people, as his Nazi says, next time send the right people. You know what I'm saying? When righteous Africans, the right people, it's not just black, 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 or so forth and so on. No, or Ethiopian, Ethi no, it's righteous. It's Adik Khan. There's a qualification. You understand? See, having that qualification means that you are not a criminal to the oncoming kingdom of the King of Kings and His Christ, the government of God, the true new world order. You understand? If you have that right, if you don't have that righteousness, you understand? Well, um, you're going to have to explain for yourself. In a sense, you will be arrested, not physically arrested, but what we're seeing. <laughs> already is is arresting news, arresting things are happening, that in spite of all the technology, in spite of all the paper or money or possessions, there are, there are even more powerful elements than all the New World Order secret societies and even occultic demonic activity. There are greater powers that be, such as the power of I and I, God, Father, the King of Kings, in and through Yeshua HaMoshiach. So it's important for us to recognize that connected now with, with the, 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 the first um, um, pilgrim season is Passover, Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of, of, of First Fruits, of the First Fruits. But now notice the qualification of this. It says, when ye be come into the land which I give you, so one of the first one of the first feasts in the land, especially after being in the land for about a year or a couple of years, must be first fruits as well as harvest. You see, as well as harvest. So we have a lot of us as Rastafari, I think I know many of I and I brothers intent probably is is is, is good or is fear seeming, but we're not doing it in Jah's order, so we're not getting the results that we should be getting. You know, um, we as this particular generation of Rastafari have a, a crushing and an awesome responsibility before us, but in and through Yeshua HaMoshiach, you know what I'm saying, in and through the Christ of His Majesty, you understand, these things we can do, you understand, we, yes, we can in the King of Kings, and his Christ, but the first step is learning. The first step is, is getting some a basic idea of what's what, who's who, you know what I'm saying? Who are we? Where we're from? How did we get here? What is God's plan in all of this? And how can we come into conformity with the will, the true will of Jah Rastafari, the true will of the God and Father? of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos. You see? So here's the key. Here's the caveat. When ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, shall reap a harvest. So that means Rastafari has to become much more eco-friendly. I mean, we always were. I'm speaking to this present generation because right now, this generation is struggling with the golden calf, with Baal Peor, you understand, with some of these, uh, Balaam, you know, it's right on the cusp, you know, this particular generation today. Um, and, you know, we don't want to go into John's word. Let's just not point fingers, but let's just, let's just um, faithfully read and study and speak his word and let the chips fall you know, where, where they may. It says, Then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Now, we're going to give you a little example. Now, you already know we say the, the, the cannabis or the cannabis. 
you know, is the lamb's is the lamb's bread. You already know. Now, the exact reason for that, you understand, know might have been lost on many of you know, many rosters and, and others, but we can see the true meaning, you know what I'm saying? We should see the true meaning of that, even in something so precious and so small. You see that right there? Now they say they have sought to make God's God's creation illegal. Imagine that. They can't last too long. They want to make God's creation illegal instead of learning the truth behind it. Now, so this is an example of the first fruits. And we have some interesting shots from Morocco. Morocco over there in um, um, northwest Africa. The, some of the people, what they do is the farmers, they grow these large, um, like, um, hemp stalks. And there's some pictures where you see them in the field, just like the, it reminds me of the wave offering. You understand, we, where they're waving large stalks. Now, all we have, you understand, are, are smaller ones, like little buds like this. You understand, where it looks like a little bush. It's a miniature of a tree. You can see that right there. And we want to get into the cannabis Christ, overstanding the cannabis in its true sacramental. You see, because our argument about religious rights is justifiable. You know, they say, oh, cannabis is illegal, so forth and so on. Well, that might be to those who don't have any religious or sacramental God-given right to use it. It, it. it probably should be. And there's a reason for that, you know, because even, even scripturally speaking, if we say that the herb is, is, is holy, right, if we say the herb is holy, right, that, 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 that marijuana is holy. This is what we as Rastafari, we're not speaking so much about medicinal marijuana, so forth and so on, although there is a very logical argument about that. And in fact, you know, what's the symbol of the, of the medical professional? It's the Cadeus, the serpent, the Hermes, the wings, so forth and so on. Well, you know where that comes from. That comes right out of the priesthood of, of ancient Egypt, the Hebrae, who later became known as the Hebrew. And the God of the Hebrews, his symbol was the burning bush. You understand? But now, besides just pointing to that, let us study and really find out what is the theology. You see, there's a theology that's connected with the cannabis and, and Christ. And we're touching on this particular reasoning right here, kind of delving it into... Um, once again, into Leviticus, you know what I'm saying? We're now in Leviticus 23, but this particular Shabbat, and I think that we will go through with this Shabbat, which is uh, Shemeni, which means the eighth. It's the third word, first distinctive word in this Torah portion, which is the 26th weekly Torah portion or part of Shah in the annual Judaic um, cycle of Torah reading. And the third, this is the third now, in the book of Leviticus, the Orit Ze Lewawiyan, it constitutes Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 to chapter 11, verse 47. Now, we as black Jews, Ethiopian Hebrews, and elect Rastafari, along with other Jews in the diaspora, we read it in the 25th or 26th Sabbath after the Simchat Torah, or the Sisha Le orit, which is, say, the joy, the joy of the law or the joy of Jah's law, generally in late March or April. Now, this particular portion, this kufl or parsha, this parsha tells of the consecration. Now, how the tabernacle in the wilderness, right, which is an example in a sense of the church and is even an example to us, you know what I'm saying? In this phase of coming out of Babylon, and in this phase, early phase and stage of, of, of exodus, because we are and we have been in an exodus movement as a people, the once lost but now found Beta Israel for, get this, more than 40 years. It's time for us to come out and enter in to the promised land. But check this, the preparation Remember, who has given us the, the, the land? Who has given us the land? Our African home. It's Jah. 
You understand? It's, the, it's Yahweh. It's the God and Father, our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christus, Yeshua HaMoshiach. That means that if it's Yahweh that has given us the land in and through, you understand, our God, King, Ketamari Honda Salasi, then we must do it Yah's way as well. And so if we ask ourselves, well, man, how come we had it so long and what's going on? Shashmani, EWF, so forth. Because it has not been done Jah's way. I mean, I mean, the logic of that is, is so, so beautiful, so simple, even a, a little baby, a little child could get it. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, when they grow up, it's those children that get it. Remember what happened to the Israelite? The whole generation wandered in the wilderness. And we see many of the elders have passed on, even recently, um, Fik Fikra Selassie, Dr. Gladstone Robinson. So this is also a, a, a very important sign to us that it's a generation. You understand? This is a new generation. You understand? The old generation, you understand, kind of have, have, they came out in a sense, but they still wandered in the wilderness. You understand? Because they did not have John's instructions. You understand? And did not come up to that, 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 that corporate responsibility. You see, we as Rastafari, we have to build the corporate body, which is the true church of Rastafari, which is not just a building, but it is, it is the spree de corps. It is the spirit of the body. You know what I'm saying? That means that who is the head? Ras, Tefari. It is the king of kings. It is Christ. It's his testimony. Teach him his mind. That's the head. So we have to get that up in the head. You know what I'm saying? In the head and the heart and, and, and walk it out and work it out. And practice makes perfect. So I and I don't have no excuse by saying, oh, nothing's perfect. Well, what's you've got to practice? Do you even know what you're doing? Do you even know what Rastafari means? I mean, what it really means. Parsha tells of the consecration of the tabernacle, the death of um, Nadav and Avihu, or Nadav and Abihu, which is interesting because there's a whole strange fire. There's a strange fire kind of um, incident right there. And then it speaks of the dietary laws, which are known Hebraically as Kashrut. Kashrut. So we want to kind of touch on both the, the cannabis Christ and, 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 and the whole connection of cannabosum. Because we think that it's been too long that we've been kind of like um, just speculating on it and not backing it up with, 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 with real um, theology that's based on the teaching of the scripture that anyone who's interested, they can learn about it and if they choose. See, it's all about choice. You understand? If they choose to experience, you understand, um, um, Christ as cannabis or Christ through that, that sacrament, you understand, that anabosum that the cannabis is, the witness of Christ's crucifixion, the two witnesses, Mary and John. Remember when Christ says, you know, um, woman, behold your son, you know, behold your mother, and he took her, uh, John, and Mary, marijuana. You know what I mean? You have to stop and say, wait, there's, there's something bigger. You know, you know, there's something bigger going on here. You know, because we're sure that when men and people probably called it so, they probably didn't know. Somebody knew. That's how that name got attached to it as um, marijuana. And where was Christ crucified? In the place of the skull. So there's a lot that's connected with marijuana that really answers a lot of these questions when we say that marijuana, really in a sense, even in our society, it would not be permissible to everybody. I'm talking about in a true Arastafari society based on the righteousness of the King of Kings and his Christ and the teachings of his majesty in the Bible. It, it would not be something that um, is it's holy, then it must be treated as, as such. So some of the things that we might um, do to circumstances have to pass through in this Babylon should not dictate to us or even get us in the bad habit of this is what we're seeking to establish. You know what I mean? This is what we're seeking to establish. I mean, you look at a lot of different groups had to do what they had to do, you understand, with their backs against the wall, 
but even they must have had a vision, you understand, of, of better things. You, you know, otherwise, they would have gotten stuck. And it seems like a generation of Rastafari has gotten stuck. You know what I'm saying? And, and we're not going to ridicule them or blame them, but we, this is what we observe to be true, and there are facts and factors that prove itself. Now, just continuing this part right here, that it says at this particular point that when we come into the land, we are to reap a harvest thereof, and then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. He shall wave the sheaf. So symbolically, think of the spliff in a sense, right, as the sheaf. I showed you the bud already, but think of the spliff as the sheaf, right? He shall wave it before Yahweh, before Egeziyaviher Lotu Sephat, to be accepted for you, to be accepted on your behalf on the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. Interesting. Now notice it says, on the morrow after the Sabbath. Now notice, this year is so perfect in a sense. This 2012 is so perfect when you think about it. There's a witness. It says that the moon is John's faithful witness, and this is how we calculate the holy days according to the reflected light of the moon, right, according to the law of the mother. In other words, so we have the 6th, notice we have the 6th of April, beginning that's going into the Friday evening, going into the Sabbath, the 7th. Then we have the 13th, which is now, also Friday, so-called evening, going into the Sabbath. Then right after the seven days of unleavened bread is over, it's now speaking to the people, speaking to the children of Israel. This means that if it's for the children of Israel in spirit and in truth, it's for us as children of the Ethiopians. How do I and I know that? Well, look at Amos Amos 9 and 7, that will prove that to you. You understand? In other words, the Ethiopian Hebrews, the true, the faithful Ethiopians. Now, it says right here that, um, and ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering to Yahweh. Now, the sacrificing of animals, we know that the Moshiach, Jesus Christos, Joshua, he took that away. So it's, it's actually gone, it's gone from the Levitical order to the Judahite or to Judah or the Melchizedek. But in pattern, according to Hebrews, it's according to the pattern of Lewi or the pattern of Levi. So what we're studying here is the pattern of Levi. So when you come across the different animals, as we tried to touch on it in some of the previous teaching, you really have to understand what are these animals types of in Christ? What aspect of the Moshiach and how is this aspect, this word to be eaten? How is this word to be assimilated within to one's consciousness and to one's um, heart and one's mind and how can they walk it out? You understand? In other words, work out their salvation, that we have this gracious opportunity to even work out. And it says, and the meat offering there too shall be two-tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. And the meat offering is what, like, in ancient Egypt they call this the hatep, or the hetep, hetep or hatep, the hatepu, which was like a kind of a, a, a non a non debtors It was like a veg, like foam wet. You understand? Like vegetarian food or non meat. What says the meat offering has no meat in it. It should be the meal offering. There too shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire. This offering is made by fire. So I want you to pay careful attention to the use of various elements. It speaks of earth. It speaks of wind or spirit. It speaks of water. It speaks of fire. It speaks of place and space for those four elements. You know, for those four elements. And so there's a there's an aspect of sacred geometry that needs to be understood as well. So the offering is made by fire to Yahweh for a sweet savor. That means for a sweet smell. Now I don't know about some of y'all. 
you know, I mean, I don't know, like, you know, about some of you, but the, the, the kind of bolson, especially if it's natural, if it's good, you know, if it was done with, with good intentions and proper, I mean, it's the most beautiful smell, the marijuana smell. Some folks, I know some folks, I don't know. I, I would like to think like, oh, they must got a demon or something like that. That's why they act that way. You know, but some folks are like, oh, mm -mm, I don't know if people do that.